In this video, we're going to try to continue rooting out this problem that is likely plaguing your chess game, that of the erroneous piece trades. So let's do a reminder about why this is such an important question in chess. Uh, piece trades should not be considered as something automatic, you know, that just happens in a chess game. You have to see it as a conscious, strategic decision about what you're choosing to leave on the chessboard, right? So even though uh, piece trades can sometimes be neutral for both sides, um, very often they're going to be helping or hurting one side more than the other. So whenever you're facing any piece trade, I would encourage you guys to just automatically know that this is an important decision. So our first example is going to be um, from a game of a student of mine played very recently. And this student is one of my more advanced players rated over 2000 USCF. Right now, the white rook is under attack and white has a few options how to get it out of attack. So they can move it or they can offer up a bishop trade, right? Well, remember, if you don't offer a trade of pieces, that's less of a commitment, right? Less of a chance to make a mistake, actually. <laughs> if you're going to offer a piece trade, you need to be very clear on why you're doing it. So let's talk about the move bishop c3 that was played in the game and why it's such a big mistake. So actually, guys, I think there are at least three reasons why this move is a big mistake. And you can pause the video and try to consciously think of those reasons if you feel like your positional understanding um, is up to it. And if you're completely confused as to why that's a bad move, well, I'm going to explain it to you. So first of all, white has a space advantage, right? And how do we know that? Well, white has two pawns in the center, further advanced than any of black's pawns, so that gives them a space advantage. And one of the rules about that is that you don't want to trade pieces when you have more space because you're really just helping out your opponent in a more cramped position. Eliminate some of those extra pieces. So that's already a pretty weighty reason to uh, vote against the move bishop c3. But it, there's actually um, much more than that. So the other thing is if we think about black's main ideas in this position, um, does black have any bad pieces? Yes, they do. They have a bishop that is closed by a pawn which naturally means they're going to try to play c5 to give that bishop an open diagonal. So that's really like such a key part of black's plans here. Now, it's actually not that easy to implement because every time you try that move, it's going to get met by this move and this bishop is going to have enormous power on the diagonal. So basically your bishop will become much better than it currently is when black tries to implement their main idea. And thirdly, um, if you play this move, what are you leaving yourself with? Well, you're going to leave yourself with that one single bishop on d3. And if you look at the pawn structure, these three pawns, which cannot easily change their positions, they're on the same color as the bishop, so that's not a very good relationship. Your dark squares are going to be pretty weak here. Like, obviously, there's like this hole on b4. And, um, and as soon as black plays the move c5, which they did in the game, um, they're just going to have a superior bishop to you. You know, their pawns are going to be on the dark squares. Yours are going to be on the light squares. And that's going to favor their bishop. So you're basically leaving yourself with the worst bishop on the board. So three reasons why this block is bad. It's quite a lot of reasons, right, guys? Um, you know, a lot of things to dissuade you from that trade. And of course, the better move would have been rook e3. Um, the general idea in this position for white actually is to get the knight to e5 and actually to do a rook lift and start an attack against the black king. Quite a realistic plan, given that white's bishops are pointed towards the king side and they can even add the rook in as well. And black has a real problem here because, you know, c5 is always running into this move and the pawn cannot be taken because of the pin. And then, I mean, the bishops are just becoming so powerful on the long diagonals. So, you know, I, I guess another reason why bishop c3, not great. I mean, you're, you're removing a lot of your potential attacking power, right? Like we said, 
that this diagonal has the potential to be very important, even though currently it's closed up. Um, so yeah, this is a very big positional mistake, guys, right? And just, it's not automatic that you offer up a piece trade. Like it has so much long-term impact on the game that you need to think about it very carefully. And by the way, just a few moves um, from this trade, like white was already in quite a bad position here, right? I don't want to go into the details, like, but just looking around, it's so comfortable for black. Like, look at this dark square control, the beautiful queen, the open bishop, just very obvious moves. And really what makes white's position so bad is like this bishop is a poor piece because of the pawn structure um, and the weakness on the dark squares. So within just a few moves, white went from having a nice position with good chances to win to a position where they're on the worst side and they have to play for a draw. Now, we're also going to look at um, an example from a top player on how to execute that decision better. This is a game uh, between Hans Niemann and Vasily Ivanchuk from the recent Tournament of Peace that finished in Zagreb just a few days ago that Hans won with a brilliant score of eight out of nine. So this game was really impressive, guys. I'm just gonna show it to you from this moment. It was um, a Petrov. The position looks quite symmetric. This is still theory. And Black decides to offer up the bishop trade, which they don't have to be in such a hurry to do. Um, they can sort of stay with this pin for a bit longer. They can go rookie eights, but certainly the bishop trade makes sense as well because White's bishop on d3 is a good piece. So White's, um, should they try to keep the bishop? Well, the problem is they don't have a good way to keep it because the bishop on g6 will take over the diagonal. So White allows the trade to happen. Black accepts it. So you can say that that was kind of a neutral trade for both sides. Like you can't really say like which bishop uh, was better when they were both on that long diagonal. And Black continues offering up the trade. And again, should White take it? Well, they don't really have a reason to avoid it because if they avoid it, their bishop is not gonna be so great. So as you see, uh, they threaten checkmate, black blocks it, and white does the bishop trade. And it looks like not much is going on. Like pieces are just coming off the board. Is this going to be a short draw? Well, we'll see. But now white starts to take some aggressive measures um, in terms of opening up a new front. Some, it's a subject of a video I did recently. You know, they push up their pawn and they're indicating that they want to go to h5 and probe some weaknesses around the black king side. And by the way, let's look at what's left on the board. There's a knight here and a knight here. And I would say that these are different quality of pieces. You know, white's knight is much more aggressively posted and black's knight is currently doing nothing. So it's not a surprise that Ivanchuk decided to try to reposition this knight, h5 and knight e6. And here, white has a choice. So what to do? I mean, we're being offered a peace trade. So remember, we automatically know this is an important moment that we have to consciously decide about. Um, we don't really want to trade, but not trading means doing what? Like retreating, right? which uh, can sometimes also not be the best thing. But there's no other choice, guys. Yes, you must retreat the knight if you want to keep it on the board. I mean, taking is just simplifying the game um, too much, you know, because what are you going to have left to win the game with, right? So white keeps the knight on the board, guys, and I would make the case that this decision is a really important part of why white wins this game. So believe it or not, Black's best move here was taking the pawn, a very unattractive thing to do, with the idea that they're going to put this knight on g7 to guard, um, to guard h5 and somehow hold on with their king side. But yeah, it's not um, an easy decision to make at all. So I'm not surprised that Ivanchuk didn't do it. He played c6, rook h1. Now it's obviously too late to take the pawn. And Ivanchuk sees the problems of like how white is going to go there and try to bring in the queen for a checkmate. So he tries to close up the G file, sorry, the H file. And 
I mean, his move is understandable, but you're going to see how his position is going to get worse. Knight e5. And again, um, let's compare the knights. Well, this knight is looking pretty restricted. Can't do very much. White's knight is more active. It's on black side of the board, and it has a lot of potential still to come. Black played here. White brought in the queen. Yeah, black's king side is getting weaker. So kind of unpleasant. And Hans, um, you know, maybe he doesn't want to trade queens, but it, he doesn't have a great square for his queen. So he actually correctly um, does this infiltration, which forces black into the trade. And even though pieces are coming off the board, he throws in an intermediate check. Actually, white's remaining two pieces are better than both of black's remaining pieces. You can even say their king is better than the black king as well for this ensuing endgame. Quite unpleasant, guys. White has the open file. White has the more active knight. You know, they want to infiltrate to e7. Black tries to keep them out. And Hans's conversion here was very... Uh, was very nice. So he did like this, this, and black is kind of stuck, you know, with this passive rook, like this problem with the h6 pawn, and Hans kind of really zoned in on th those weaknesses, um, and then even improved the situation on the queen side. He's not in a hurry. Then he plays on the other side. Basically, black cannot move the rook, um, but of course, you know, at some point this is going to come and these pawns are going to collapse. So he tried to prepare for that, but he lost the h6 pawn and we can see that black is on his way to losing this position. It was a very, uh, very impressive display of technique by Hans and here Vasily resigned. I think it's because White wants to go knight, uh, king g5 and knight f6 checkmate. So kind of a helpless situation for black. But anyway, if you think strategically, guys, what helped white win this game? It was the fact that when he was facing um, a peace trade that he had a choice about, he uh, correctly understood that this peace trade would not, was not in his favor, that his knight had better potential, and he was willing to move it back to preserve it on the board. Later on, it moved into an active square. He saw the potential of this piece, and therefore he avoided trading it. And that's really what won him the game. So, um, yeah, two examples, guys. One of a bad piece trade and one of a good um, avoidance of a piece trade. So... Basically, just try to pay attention to these moments. Try to recognize their strategic importance for the long run of your game. It really matters what pieces you are keeping on the board because chess is ultimately about, you know, having the better pieces than your opponent. So these decisions should always be made consciously and never automatically.